Well, I want to welcome everybody to our uh, landlord tenant educational workshop for this evening. Um, we, tonight we have uh, Captain Bobby Wright with the uh, rental inspections office, Officer Kari Ray with the police department and code enforcement, and then we have um, community services director, manager, excuse me, community services manager, um, Stephanie Sheets, and myself, John Chilling. I'm with the fire department. I'm the fire chief. So. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to do a little introduction and we're going to watch a video um, to begin with. It's about 14 minutes long and it's out of a major metropolitan area about some uh, issues that have happened in that community, which is um, really compacted with a lot of uh, universities and a lot of rental properties. And I want to preface this by saying that this video by no means depicts what Cedar Falls is like. However, it has some good information and some valuable lessons that everybody on, on this team, which is landlords, tenants, city staff, and elected officials, need to know about so we can keep this type of, these types of issues from happening here in Cedar Falls. And again, I want to preface this is not anything that Cedar Falls is like. However, 20 years ago, this community didn't have these problems either. So. The health and safety of students in America's college capital are increasingly at risk. As local universities accept more students than they can house, young people are pouring into often shoddy apartments in neighborhoods like Brighton and Alston. So this is our bathroom and this is what we moved into. It's disgusting. There's this door, which there's no lock that works on it and goes directly towards the outside. Overcrowding is rampant. Universities look the other way, and the city seems powerless to stop it. It's a cat and mouse game. The inspector's knocking on the front door, and the mattresses are going out the back door. And, you know, we put them in a truck, drive them around the block, wait till we're gone, and, and come back and move back in. Houses with code violations and crammed with college students can be lucrative for landlords, distressing for neighbors, and have serious consequences for occupants. 87 landed fire. House, the house is on fire. All the mass. There's girls on the roof. They're about to fall. Oh my God, this girl just fell. A nine month Globe Spotlight team investigation goes inside Boston's shadow campus. send your child off to college, you think you know what the risks are. Turns out it's not so true. Austin. Austin, okay, and you say your house is on fire? Yes, completely. Okay, sir, um, leave the building, we're going to be right there. Until recently, this hole in the ground was all that remained of 84 Linden Street in the heart of a heavily populated student neighborhood in Austin. In 2012, the building that stood here housed seven students from Boston University. Sophomore Joshua Goldenberg had picked the bedroom in the attic and loved his first taste of off-campus living. That was a great location. It was a great spot to live right across the street from the fraternity house. The commute was very short. The place was clearly uh, not maintained. Josh's father wasn't as impressed. but. You know, we, uh, we didn't want to uh, hover and helicopter too much over Josh, so we, he was fine. We left him there, and that was it. In the early hours of January 22nd, 2012, something went wrong. I remember nothing of uh, that night or that morning or that month, that, I don't know, that year, who knows. It's on fire. The house is on fire. What part of the city are you in? As the students slept, the building caught fire. Startled residents woke up and escaped through windows and doors. Leave the building, we're going to be right there. For Josh, on the top floor, the only safe escape would have been down the stairs. But the stairs were on fire, leaving only one other option. There was no way out except through that one window, which was a third-story window with nothing below it except the driveway. Josh jumped. A friend found him twitching and unconscious on the icy driveway. He was in a coma for nearly two weeks and suffered major head trauma and neurological problems that linger still. 
My vision was damaged. My speech is still an issue. It's just not the same. The cause of the fire was never determined. Josh sued the landlords, and the case was recently settled out of court. A little more than a year later, fire ripped through a two-family house just across the street from where Josh had lived. Austin fight. Oh, we're getting people out right now. 87 Linden Street was housing 14 residents. At least one of the units was overcrowded. Bin Lin Lee, a 22-year-old Boston University student just weeks away from graduation, was living in an attic bedroom. The only exit was a stairway that led into the flames. Kiri and his friends were already on the roof, and I kept screaming to Kiri, like, where's Binlin? Where's Binlin? It was so smoky upstairs. He said he opened the door, and he couldn't see it. He could just hear her. He just heard her scream. Does anyone know where Binlin is? No. Oh. Does anyone know she came home? Binlin died in the fire. In April, on the one-year anniversary of the fire, Binlin's mother, aunt, and several friends returned to 87 Linden Street to remember the marine science major and her passions for scuba diving, photography, and cooking. A lawyer for Binlin's family blames both the landlord and the city. 87 Linden Street was an illegal rooming house with serious safety problems, including no second exit from Bin Lindley's apartment. Josh Goldenberg's house was also illegally overcrowded and had gone years without city inspections. That room that Josh was in should never have been rented to anybody. They're not inspecting and they're not enforcing. They're turning a blind eye. A Globe Spotlight team investigation has found that a collision of greed, neglect, and mismanagement is endangering the lives of young people in Boston. Many absentee investors maximize their profits by packing students into their properties and routinely ignore critical housing codes. Inspectional services. code violations. The city's effort to safeguard students and preserve city neighborhoods from real estate speculators has failed by almost every measure. The city is guilty because they didn't enforce their own rules. Over 45,000 students live off campus in Boston. Living independently, often for the first time in their lives, is a big draw, but so is the money they can save. Off-campus apartments are usually less expensive than dorms, and as area universities continue to accept more students than they can house, the number of students living off-campus in Boston has soared, up more than a third since 2006. Alston is a magnet for students from Boston University and other colleges. It has earned a well-known nickname, Rat City. And we have that broken with rats. It's a pretty big rat. We have a rat about this big. They come up through the stove sometimes. The rats are disgusting. They're, they're bigger than my kittens. I saw it crawling out of the toaster. I was like, I almost threw it. But in several student apartments the Spotlight team visited, rats are just a small part of the problem. We use the stove to uh, heat our place during the winter since the, the heating didn't work. It's dangerous, but it was really nice and warm. It doesn't stay shut without the deadbolt. The window screens. I'm going to tell her to get them. We tried to open the window once and kind of figured this out. Yep. So that In the summer of 2013, Mike Dalstrom, a junior at BU, and his six roommates paid $5,250, or $750 each, to share this dilapidated house full of code violations. It's on Linden Street, right next door to the house that Binlin Lee died in. You know, it just is wedged in there. Rat droppings. This is what we, we moved into. And pretty much everything that you're seeing here, we didn't do. The property owner, who lives in California, said he was unaware of the conditions in the building and said his property manager was in charge of upkeep. 
His house is fairly typical of a large number of buildings the Spotlight team visited during its investigation. So this is your room upstairs? Yeah, this is my room. But rat droppings and disgusting bathtubs are minor compared to the dangerous health and safety hazards found across these student neighborhoods. What's in there? It's the other bedroom on the third floor. Dahlstrom's so-called room on the third floor was actually the entryway to his roommate's bedroom and there's only one way down. There's no way out of his room. The stairs to get to his room are from there. Right outside my window, there's not even any kind of awning I could even think about jumping onto. It's just a driveway. Kind of get used to it because a lot of places off campus are like this, if not most of them. Paul Martinez lived with Dahlstrom. Um, I mean, so this is Mike's room. I have to walk through it to get to mine. When it comes down to it, the landlords have been in real estate for decades, and they sort of know how to work the system. Some landlords, like Anwar Faisal, shown here being confronted by city inspectors, repeatedly rent out apartments with code violations. He has faced minimal penalties while flouting state regulations for years. Do you think your insurance company is going to cover you? Faisal later appeared at a city hearing after inspectors condemned the apartment. How are they going to get out of that unit? You've got windows blocked, you've got one fire escape coming down on the window, it has an iron grate on it. This was Faisal's second Fenway apartment in two years, condemned by Boston inspectors. They want to condemn the unit because Mr. Faisal own it. They want to harm Mr. Faisal for no reason. It was a fire trap and had not been approved by the city to be rented out. You need to square that away. Faisal made some renovations and leased the apartment out again. But the city continues to say he lacks a certificate of occupancy to make the unit legal. While some students are unaware of their rights as tenants, others hesitate to report problems, especially when they're cramming in roommates to share the rent. If no one complains, we're, we're not going to look for problems someplace uh, if no one's complaining about it. Brian Glasscock is chief of Boston's Inspectional Services Department, or ISD which oversees the city's rental units. Although the city says reform is underway, ISD largely inspects only in response to complaints. Glasscock says that in the student rental market, students and landlords have a financial incentive not to call ISD. Cram a lot of people in there. Individual rents stay relatively manageable but the landlords uh, reap a, a pretty substantial windfall. The last person they're going to tell is the, the city. ISD is no match for the flood of violations and routinely misses health and safety problems. The city could not turn up one student overcrowding citation since 2008. As more students move off campus, they are having tangible and sometimes detrimental effects on the Boston neighborhoods they're taking over. It was the parties late at night, going into the night. Noreen Lochran grew up in this triple-decker in Mission Hill, but recently sold it, partly because she was fed up with the neighborhood's direction. I really, really didn't want to sell it to a developer, but you can, can't get a family to buy around here anymore. Other folks who maybe don't want to have five roommates have to pay market rate, which is now artificially higher uh, in the surrounding area. So it drives out working families, it drives out uh, young professionals, it drives out uh, seniors. In some neighborhoods, the demand for student housing is so intense and the rent so high that it's hard to find apartments that are not overcrowded. The city has asked colleges to provide addresses for students living off campus to help prevent overcrowding, but only one school Boston University has cooperated. Meanwhile, thousands of Boston students continue to live in dangerous apartments, a prospect that frightens those who have endured the painful consequences. Compared to a lot of friends that I have, I've experienced a lot more than them and learned a lot more. I wish I could unlearn it. Um, I never had these experiences. I'm not sure this fire would have had the consequences it had if the laws had been enforced. If the system isn't looking, the laws get broken. Okay, and like I said in the beginning, for those of you that weren't in the room when we first started,
this by no means depicts what Cedar Falls is like. However, there's a lot of information in there that um, is part of the problem that we're, we're currently having in Cedar Falls. Not to the degree that they're talking about in, in Boston. But um, recently we've had some issues with over-occupancy, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about you know, today, right now, is the over-occupancy thing. Um, to begin with, we don't want to turn a blind eye to anything, but we need more eyes, and this is a team effort. It's an effort of the city staff, the landlords, the tenants, all need their eyes on things to make sure that everybody stays safe and everybody um, stays within the, the rules that are out there for occupancy. Um, really quickly, uh, a real quick fire statistic for people in Cedar Falls to know. Since January of 2014 to, to today's date, 50% of the fires that we've responded to in structures have been in rental properties. 50%. Rental properties only constitute 14% of the structures in Cedar Falls. So when 50% of your fires are happening in 14% of your buildings, big red flag for the fire department, there's a problem here. So um, in the fire service, we have a, we have a mission. We, we have a mission to educate. Then we mitigate, meaning if education doesn't work and something bad happens, we go out and we take care of that problem. And then the third piece of that is evaluate. So we mitigate or we educate, we mitigate, and then we evaluate. And after the evaluation, we go back to the education piece again. And we try to go back out and educate people based on the information that we learned from those bad things that do happen to try to prevent those from happening again. Um, give one quick example of a recent fire in, in a rental property that people just make poor choices. Um, but through education and then hopefully no evaluation or no mitigation and no evaluation, if we can keep this on the education piece, it won't happen again. Uh, recently we had a fire in a rental property and the fire was caused by, because they overloaded the electrical system in an older home. The tenants somehow broke the thermostat for the furnace. Instead of calling the landlord and getting the thermostat fixed, they decided just to put a bunch of space heaters in. Well, that, that's a problem. The other issue was that the landlord, I don't think he knew, but he put blown in insulation over knob and tube wiring. Knob and tube wiring is basically bare wire. So they put that type of insulation over a wire that is not supposed to have anything in contact with it. When they overloaded the system, the electrical system with the space heaters and drew too much power, it overheated that electrical wire and it caused a smoldering fire up in the attic from the blown in insulation. That's an, that's an example. So we have two education opportunities here. Number one, educate the tenants on if there's something broken, contact your landlord and get it fixed. The second piece is we educated the landlords and we put in a article in the, the latest Currents newsletter that went out to everybody about the proper care and maintenance of knob and tube wiring and what you can do and what you can't do with that type of wiring. So hopefully that education piece is going to, based on the evaluation of what we mitigated, <laughs> using those words again, um, will prevent this from happening again. So again, we wanna educate people Last thing we want to do is go mitigate something, but we're prepared to do that. And then finally, we're going to evaluate what happened, and then we're going to go back out and try to re-educate people to prevent that from happening again. So, again, the last thing I want to talk about with this is it's a team effort. Um, when we talk about over-occupancy, it's a team effort. Um, Officer Ray is going to talk about over-occupancy and, and how we determine when it's over-occupied and what the ramifications or repercussions are going to be about that. Um, but it is a team effort, tenants, landlords, and city staff. The only way we're going to have a great rental um, program in the city of Cedar Falls is to have everybody on the same page. Thus, we're having all these workshops. So, And we'll get questions if we can get through the presentation since we have cameras on and everything. We'll answer all your questions at the end, and uh, we'll have plenty of time for that. So, Next, uh, we're going to have Officer Ray come up and talk about uh, landlord-tenant responsibilities. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I'm going to just uh, start off after him with monitoring your properties. You know, this fire, um, 
had the landlord done the normal walkthroughs of the apartments, watching his uh, places, he would have known that they were using a bunch of space heaters um, and that something was wrong. Why were they using these? So what we're asking um, in our collaborative effort here is for you guys to take the time to once a month, every other month, whatever it might be for you to go walk through your properties. I just was talking to a landlord where they had um, one room always locked off from him. And that's your property. If you're giving them the 24 hour notice that you need to, to walk through, find out what's going on in there. Um, we determined through our investigation without knowing that this was going on, that that house was over occupied. They had it locked because they had a fifth bed in there um, and somebody living in there that they obviously didn't want him to know about. So just try to make that part of your regular routine of I need to go and check this, make sure they're not da damaging your properties. And, um, you know, Captain Wright just had somebody call where he did this walkthrough and said they just tore down our smoke detectors. And Captain Wright had been there two months ago and knew that they were all working. This was actually the second time those tenants had torn down those sm smoke detectors. Um, so he was able to take action on that and actually the landlord evicted those tenants. So that's what we want to see is just this effort by both um, sides. Uh, maintaining the properties, you know, if there's a problem and a tenant comes to us, what we're going to do is ask for that in writing, whatever the complaint might be. But the first thing we're going to do is say, have you talked to your landlord? Try to um, get them to go straight to you guys to fix these problems. Um, and hopefully that way, if we don't need to get involved and send a letter of building maintenance, we don't want to do that. Um, but if they need our assistance, we can definitely do that too. And if as landlords, you guys are having problems where maybe somebody's parking in your front yard and tearing it up or doing something like that where you want the enforcement side of it, we want to encourage you to contact us if you've already notified them that this action is unacceptable, um, which comes by, you know, watching your properties and monitoring them. Um, this is the time of the year that uh, front yard parking becomes an issue, not only because they're parking in the front yard, um, because the ground soft, we're causing ruts and damage, they're tearing it up. Uh, so please help to educate your tenants on, they can only park in the driveway. Uh, it is a $150 ticket. It's not your normal parking um, ticket of $10. It's $150 plus court costs. And especially this month, for some reason, we've seen uh, a spike in that. Um, I'm not sure the reason. And then uh, over occupancy, this has become a problem. Uh, I think it's been a problem in the past, but maybe brought to our attention more recently, uh, which is why we showed this video. But in talking with students, they're acknowledging that Yes, they're putting in um, that fifth person. We've even had six, seven people in an apartment, which is way too many. Um, and it cuts down on their costs. You know, some of these older houses are massive and they say, but there's bedrooms for them. It's still not safe. So what we've done is uh, the city actually met with our attorneys. And what we've decided is that uh, on these over occupancies that we can prove um, we're going to start citing the tenants right away. And if there's five people in that um, house, all five will get a citation. That's a $500 citation with an $85 court cost. So um, what, what we need, and if the landlords know about this going on, this over-occupancy, they too will get that same citation. Um, but our reasoning is A, for safety, B, they know that they can only have, if it's four, they can only have four with these new ordinance that's going into effect. The, uh, the occupancy will be posted on their permit, which is required that you guys have posted in the apartments. So they should know it should be posted right there for them of how many people can live in that house. So if the occupancy is only two, and we come in and find three people, all three of them will be cited. 
Um, the landlord accountability points will then go into effect, um, and I believe that's a five-point violation. So this affects not only the tenants, but the landlords as well. Um, and I th we've had six, I think, in the last month reported that we have found it as over-occupied apartments in Cedar Falls. Um, that might not sound like a big number, but it is. I mean, and that's six people who, um, if there's a fire and they can't get out, there's no egress window because they've made, put a mattress in the basement or whatever the case might be. Uh, I think we can all realize that there's probably going to be some lawsuits, just like that video said. Um, so that if you're walking through those apartments monthly or monitoring them, hopefully we can curb this problem of over-occupancy and um, get a handle on that. The next thing I just want to touch about is items at the street curb. We're coming up on the end of the semester and move in, move out time. I just want to show a couple examples here of what's acceptable and not acceptable. Our public works department does do curbside pickup for bulk items. Now bulk items are your couches, TVs, dressers, um, desks, anything like that. What is not accepted is the extra bags of garbage that might be placed on the bulk pile at the curb. Um, we do, they do charge a small fee, but I think it's $5, which is well worth it. There are some additional costs, you know, for appliances or tires or something like that. But all we request is that you make an appointment with our public works department, and then that you don't put those items at the curb. Um, the earliest would be 24 hours before your pickup date. And uh, so as we see these piles coming up on move in, move out, our process, just so you guys know, is that we will take a photograph, uh, write down the address. I will come back to the office. I try to either call or email all the landlords so that they know, even though hopefully you're monitoring your properties during this time and watching. Um, and then we give you 48 hours to get it off the curb. So if you have an appointment, you know, 48 hours should be fine because it shouldn't be out there more than 24 hours before that appointment. And if those items still remain after the 48 hours, we have a contract company that comes and picks those items up. And then it's a $200 flat fee, plus they have additional charges for tires and appliances. Um, and that gets billed to the property owner. So I just want you guys to be aware that um, it does fall back on you. So now I'm going to go over a couple of the changes to the rental code, really in terms of the occupancy level. I think that that's one area that has gotten a lot of attention, was discussed quite a bit um, over the past couple months. And this is an abbreviated version. There's much more information available online. Uh, and I have a handout that's kind of what I refer to as the cheat sheet for um, understanding on an existing rental. So an existing rental, uh, one that is registered prior to the moratorium, which was August of 2014, it was registered. It is able to retain uh, the limit that was in place at that time of up to four unrelated persons per unit. This uh, can be uh, in place until the time that the property is sold or transferred. At that time, there's an uh, evaluation and the ordinance outlines that evaluation where um, the unit could automatically remain at the four unrelated if it meets four criteria, or it might reduce to three unrelated persons at that time. If that reduction occurs, there is an appeal process for uh, the future uh, property owner could go through in order to request uh, remaining at that higher occupancy level. So those triggers, and I mentioned that I have the handout and that is available on our website, I'll just briefly go through those. So a property, an existing rental that's registered and if it's sold or transferred can automatically remain at four unrelated persons if the lot width is greater than 70 feet, if the lot area is greater than or equal to 8,000 square feet, if the street width is greater than or equal to 31 feet, and if there are already four off-street parking spaces in place. If those conditions are not met, 
then it automatically reduces to three, and then, like I said, there can be an appeal. There are a couple other termination provisions, kind of a typical termination as if the property is not used for a certain period of time, uh, those types of things. And so that's all uh, written in the ordinance and, and we can go through those details if there are questions about that. There's also a requirement that existing rentals, if there are any gravel surfaces there, that within three years of the next inspection after the new ordinance was adopted, which was uh, February of 2015, within three years of that inspection, all gravel must must be removed and uh, paved surfaces are required. So um, we want to make sure that people are aware of that and as our, um, Captain Wright is doing inspections, he is uh, making landlords aware of that provision. And there, there is a requirement prior to paving that a land use permit be obtained and that comes through our office through um, planning and community services and we're making sure that our requirements for setbacks on driveways and the maximum width that they can be and where the pavement can be, making sure that all of that is met. And like I mentioned, then at the sale or transfer, we're evaluating the property. And like I said, there's trigger for where it could automatically remain at the four unrelated or it might reduce. In terms of new rentals, something that was not registered prior to um, uh, August of 2014, uh, that's considered a new rental and they automatically start out at being able to rent to a family or two unrelated persons. When there's a request or an interest in uh, increasing that to three unrelated persons or four or even five, then that triggers uh, a review first through what we call a group rental review. And what we're evaluating there is uh, the carrying capacity of not just the structure, but the lot as well. And uh, there are seven criteria that we're reviewing for, and it's a small committee that uh, has meetings set twice a month, and there's information about that on our website as well. I want to go over the paving requirement and just a little bit of the ins and outs of uh, where paving can occur. And uh, these bullet points are also available on the city's website with just a couple others. Um, I wanted to try to keep it just a little short today. But in general, uh, a driveway that is the width of the garage that's serving the garage, in general, that needs to be at least three feet from the property line. Uh, the driveway uh, typically, and we might have older situations where it's a little bit narrower, but typically the driveway is going to be for like a one car garage, going to be about 10 feet wide. Uh, like I mentioned, we're looking for the driveway to match the width of the garage. Uh, if it's more than that, uh, we're going to be having a higher level of scrutiny about that because we're seeing situations where those get uh, manipulated into parking lots, more parking areas, and don't serve the, the driveway function and, and start to impact the character of the neighborhood. So uh, when it's a parking lot, and we have cases of that of rentals where maybe they have alley access or maybe they have a driveway going to the back where there's a parking lot, uh, parking lots are required to be five feet from the property line. They're required to have landscaping around them. And uh, we also are uh, in the process of passing an ordinance that requires them to be located only in the rear yard and that there's going to be uh, a minimum amount of, uh, there's going to be a requirement about the amount of open space that needs to be in place too. The point is we don't want a parking lot to cover the entire backyard. That also is not the character of a neighborhood. So uh, that be looking for information on that to come out once that's adopted. I think that's a little bit of the ins and outs of uh, parking and driveways. I was also going to give just a little bit of a, um, a overview of what we have available on our website. Uh, we have tried to put more information on the city's website and you can go to www.cedarfalls.com backslash rental. What's available on the website, just to briefly go over that, is uh, information about the changes in the rental code, links to the code itself, links to the PowerPoint presentation that's kind of the cheat sheet of that, of which uh, one of the handouts is available regarding the existing rentals and understanding the triggers for occupancy level and when that gets evaluated. Uh, also, the new definition of a family. Uh, is on the website along with links to rental application, uh, links to uh, the baseline information that we have asked all of the existing rentals to provide, uh, and that baseline information is uh, due in August of this year. So, uh, and those applications are also available tonight. 
So links to that are available, as well as some information on the paving, which I just reviewed. So that's generally what we have on the website. And if we have uh, people um, asking a lot of other questions, we're certainly going to try to respond to those and have information on the website so that that can be a resource for people. Do you want me to stand up here for yeah. questions? Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, my question pertained to uh, the year uh, of bill as it relates to uh, the electrical system that you said was, is there a timetable that the, that code was allowed in Cedar Falls? In other words, I've got, you know, houses at 1950, but I mean, is it 19, 1900 to 1949? When was it allowed to be built? Okay, if you're talking about the knob and tube wiring, okay, knob and tube wiring has been um, probably since 1930s, um, and it's a standard, it was a standard back then, I'm, I'm by no means an expert in knob and tube wiring, we do have a, a great electrical inspector with the city that can be able to answer those questions a lot more um, clearly for you, but what I can tell you is it's still allowed by code to be in your property, you don't have to change that, however, there are certain maintenance things that you should be aware of, like number one, Insulation should not be touching any of the, either the the, uh, the conductors where you're making turns or the wiring itself. Um, it should be free and, and have a clear airspace around the wiring because there's no there's no insulation on the wiring. It's just bare. Um, but as far as you don't need to change the, the wiring in your house now. We just want people to be aware that if there is anything that comes in contact with that, it has the the, the ability to cause a fire. So, I guess my question was. If, if the house was built in 52, mm -hmm. chances are it doesn't have knob and tube. I mean, that's what I'm it, You can tell by looking at the attics. If you go down in the basement, if you look at the floor joists, if you got things that look like little buttons on the floor joist area, that's knob and tube wiring. Oh, okay. We have any other any questions? questions? So, um, what precipitated, given that we started off with a video that that was obviously, you know, areas of concern related to safety that need to be addressed, it's understood. But um, what started this, um, I guess, uh, community improvement angle in all of this relative to the the rear parking only and open space percentages and these sorts of things that eh, the, 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 these new elements start to be they start to sound like an overreach beyond safety but maybe you can explain well um there's been a, a lot of discussion about the status and the condition and the neighborhood quality uh, of rental areas for many years. Um, and I know that, um, you know, about five years ago, that started with the Landlord Accountability Ordinance, and there was effort there. And so, you know, that had about five years, and I believe that there, you know, were some impacts seen from that. Uh, yet we were still hearing quite a bit of concern about um, the character of the neighborhoods and the condition of the rentals. And so that's when a uh, rental task force uh, started, uh, I believe about a year and a half ago. I wasn't here at the time. Um, and had discussions probably for about uh, nine months to a year before um, anything, uh, any changes started happening. So, um, but related to the question about items that are outside of safety, for example, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the concerns were also about the character of the neighborhood. And um, certainly the desire is that rentals are blending in and rentals are part of a neighborhood and that neighborhoods are diverse and they have all types of ages, all types of um, uh People, you know, homeowners, uh, renters, you know, a, a good mix, and that's what makes a great neighborhood. So, um, so there's concern about how neighborhoods have gone beyond that, and and um, those in, that uh, owner occupied are starting to really feel uh, negative impacts of majority of rentals and uh, issues that come with that. Uh, 
Any other questions that we have this evening? Um, there's apparently, you said, a, a new definition for family. Uh, maybe you can speak a little bit about that. We'll talk about the old definition. Back in the past, before the orders was created, the definition was family was considered husband, wife, son, daughter, um, granddaughter, basically related to blood, okay? The new definition now is considered is family plus one, right? Is that correct? Right? Okay, I want to make sure I'm saying it right. Family, family plus one unrelated, okay? So now you get the ratio can be intermixed somewhat now. So you could have a um, husband and wife living in the house, and they want to move a best friend in the house, so family plus one. So that's the ratio, of, the definition of a family now. If you, it is not considered a rental property. So if, if I would rent my house, for example, I'm have, I own my own house, I live in my own house, husband and wife, and I would move my best friend in, it's not considered a rental, okay? In the past, it would have been because it's not related to me, okay? So today's definition is family plus one. But if you start having a family plus two, now it's considered a rental because you're moving two people unrelated into the house. So, and how is that impacted by the how is that impacted by the sheer number of people in the property? Uh, family, mother, father, three kids, grandmother, grandfather, and then you know you consider you're talking about occupancy levels now. Yes. Okay. Really, by code, by family, there's no really no occupancy level because you could have a husband, wife, and six kids, nine kids living in the house. Okay. On the other side of the coin here, though, is we do have a room dimension size in a house. For example, to, to be classified as a bedroom, you have to have a minimum 70 square feet. To have two people live in a room, you've got to have 110 square feet, okay? So if you have a, let's just say you have a three-bedroom house, you have 110 square feet in each bedroom. You can, in theory, you could have up to six people live in a house. It's a family, Okay. If you have more than that, then you put them in places where they shouldn't be living in. Most likely they're probably living in the basement or someplace that doesn't have an egress window. So you got to take into consideration of the bedroom size. So, you know, biggest concern is, is you have a two-bedroom apartment or two-bedroom house. You don't want to shove 10 people in the house. It's all related because then they're sleeping everywhere then. Then you're creating a, a, a dangerous situation. Did that answer your question? It did. And, and what I was relating to is that if you have seven people living in a home given you know maybe a couple or three people living in some bedroom three bedroom house those seven people living in one structure how does that relate and how has that been i guess tweaked against the unrelated people that may be only three or four in a building how does that relate seven people in a property versus four <clears throat> I don't know if I can give you an answer for that. I mean, just it's it, it's the rules. I mean, that's what the city's come up with as the as the ratio for the properties. But and and I guess you know historically, and not just with the city, even in in um, state and federal laws, there's deference to families and dependents. So it kind of mirrors that same type of approach. So. I think one last comment that I would like to, to put out there is um, we do have a uh, Section 8 federally funded um, affordable housing program in Cedar Falls, and we are always looking for additional uh, rental properties to work with that program. It is a good, viable program. Um, we have a, a great person that's running that program, and there's a lot of scrutiny over the, the tenants and make sure that they meet all the federal requirements. and. Um, again, we're just looking for more landlords to participate in that program. So, um, and then finally, um, in February, I believe we sent out a letter to all the, the landlords to provide existing rental information. It was a, a four page document that we sent that we were looking for information to come back. And just want to remind everybody that those are due back by August 15th of this year. Uh, it'd be great if we could get those in and get them into the database and we can use those for future statistical purposes. and. Um, um, when we need to do research on existing problems, again, you know, when we want to go back out and educate people to prevent bad things from happening. And then uh, finally, our next workshop is going to be August 13th, 2015 at 530. Um, 
tentatively it's at the community center, but that, that location may change back to City Hall again. Um, but we'll definitely have something out in the next current um, edition in July um, to let you know exactly where the location of that session will be. The content will be a little bit different than today. We're always trying to add more content, change it up so the landlords and the tenants who come in and visit us with these workshops or if they watch them on Channel 15, it's always new information. We'll continue to talk about some of the issues that keep recurring, but we'll also always try to bring in new information to that. So, and you have one more question. These actions relative to, to all of them, when will we get to the point of being what I would call settled? I mean, obviously, if things uh, need to be addressed and, and there's safety issues and the like, then obviously they need to be addressed as they come about and things do change. But um, I think, uh, you know, landowners, landlords need to have some degree of, of understanding as to when things are settled because as businesses, you know, we also have to plan. And, uh, and and make provision for for changes, and it'd be nice to know that these things will eventually come to an end. Yeah. Otherwise, it becomes unviable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you can't do the Section Eight or anything else if you decide to get out because it's unviable and it's been made unattractive. To yeah. Sure. And that concern is one reason why the paving requirement for anything that's gravel on an existing rental uh, has three years from the period of the next inspection is try to be able to plan for that, knowing that that's an impact to the business plan. Um, so to answer that question, when council adopted this ordinance with these changes, they adopted it with the understanding that staff was going to be tracking the types of questions we got, as well as the types of issues that we were seeing with that. And uh, those could be issues that we noticed in trying to answer questions and understanding that, oh, we need to think about the interpretation or the actual application of that, as well as people who have said, I would like you to think about this provision. So we are reporting every month to council. Uh, we did a report in early April at the May 4th meeting. We will give a report again about the list of items that we are tracking. We also give a report about the number of reviews that have happened through the group rental committee for new rentals, as well as the reviews that have occurred for existing ones that have transferred ownership and been evaluated for level of occupancy. So uh, council uh, adopted this with the intent that at six months they would be evaluating and deciding if they would uh, make any changes to the ordinance and also at a year. So those are the triggers that we wanted to say, hey, we're going to adopt this. We certainly understand that through implementation, we're going to find that we're going to need to address some things or there may be requests to address other things or things in the ordinance. So that's the plan right now. But monthly updates are happening the first council meeting of every month. Now, since a, a rental property is in essence a, a business, um, and there's this uh, gravel provision. Are other areas, other businesses that may have gravel, are they in, at all affected? And, and if not, then why, why is that? Well, any business putting in uh, a parking area, it must be paved. So, and also any new residence that's going in after the time of this being enacted will have to be paved as well. So. But, uh, but, uh, I don't know, like there's a, there's a large church up here near Green Hill. They have a large gravel area that's unpaved and the like. They've obviously had it for some period of time. It's not a business, but it's, I mean, is that something that has to be paid? Those existing gravel areas, as long as they're not being used for parking, are allowed to remain as is. Um, until the time that something changes, but but they can, yeah. But if they are adding, expanding that gravel area, that's not permitted anymore. Hmm. Okay. As I look at the existing rental status report, um, my lease is basically run twelve months or two years, so. As I look at this document, then I have um, single family rental properties. So with that, the expectation is that each time I turn over a lease, that I'm going to have to fill out one of these per property, right? 
no, we're not requiring that each time the lease changes. We're just, this is baseline information um, to find out what the level of occupancy actually is there. Uh, you know, is there gravel there? Or where is the, the pavement? Just to learn a little bit more about the property uh, in general. Okay. Um, so it's a one-time right. form to complete. All right. So what I was calling attention to is that it indicates here unrelated persons, one, two, three, four. Okay, so with that, I mean, this is only good for 12 months is what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, that's correct. When the new lease goes into place, those names will change. Correct, yeah. Okay. And the other thing that I should say since you've brought up um, that – uh, baseline information that we've requested. We indicated the last workshop for, uh, for those who attended that um, it says on that form that you should provide the lease. Uh, that's technically the way the ordinance is written. However, we don't need a copy of the lease. We simply want to know the number of people and the contact information at this point. Okay, that's fine. So if you have a, a property that may not be in lease mode at this po point in time, m maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's lived in by, uh, well, maybe it's personally lived in. If we decide to move out of our house and then we decide to lease it later after we leave, um, as long as we register before the 15th of August, uh, in future, if we decide to rent it a year from now, two years from now, how does that work? Currently, your house is not registered as a rental because you, li you live in it. If you were to register your property a year down the road, then your property would be considered a new rental. You will follow, we'll have to follow the provisions, provisions that Stephanie spoke about. Okay. And another side note, too, is, is, is we're also stating to, to landlords that if your property is currently registered as a rental, as long as that permit stays valid, it will always stay as a rental. Once that permit expires, for example, they say that somebody, they vacated the rental property, they want to rent it out for six months, the permit expires, then when they register the property again, it's considered a brand new rental now. So don't let your rental permit expire. Okay. And you okay. can continue having it go, even if no one's renting it, you can just continue to exactly. renew it. We still have to come in and do the inspection once every three years, keep the permit current um, to make it Current. Right. Once it expires, then we, then we register it again. It's considered a brand new rental, like it's right. never been registered before. Right. Um, I'm hoping this is the last statement I'll make it. Maybe a statement cross okay. last question. Okay. So, um, if you had a property that was a part of, let's say, a homeowners association, let's say a condo, something like that, the provisions of the city of Cedar Falls would supersede requirements or expectations on the part beyond what the association could could dictate is that, is that correct, correct? Yes. yes yes okay yeah so so essentially you're looking at both would need to be met you know if they have typically those covenants and restrictions are a little bit higher than the minimums of our ordinance and so you need to view it as you need to meet both yeah. but if they hmm, if I'm meeting the minimum requirements of the city that I'm living in, that I pay taxes in, why would I have to go above and beyond what the city requires? Because if you're living in an area that has covenants in place that might have a different requirement and different is higher because they're adopting, saying that they want to go beyond what our minimum ordinance requirements are, then you also need to meet those. And that's something you should know going in when you bought the property. Um, you, through the title search, knew that there were deed restrictions and had an opportunity to review but them. But things can, in other words, uh, e things can change as you own the property, theoretically. I mean, people can go back and get these things, uh, you know, uh, changed, subrogated if they choose to. In fact, that's what's happening in some cases in some of these neighborhoods. And they do expire, and so if they're not renewed, then they're not in place anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anybody? Anybody? Larry, anything? No. Um, no? Good. Thank you. 
Thank you for your time. Yeah, and thank you for everybody showing up, and uh, we appreciate that, and hopefully we'll see everybody again on August 13th. Thanks.